of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Uh, Malachi is, uh, well, these last three prophets, uh, Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi, are the three prophets after the exile, after they had already started to return uh, to Israel, uh, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding Jerusalem. Haggai and Zechariah around the same time. Malachi is 100 years later. And you can cross-reference this with the end of the Old Testament, which is Second Chronicles. So you can chronicle what's happening here at the end of Second Chronicles. But here in Malachi, he's a hundred years later. We've already discovered through Haggai, the Reb- uh, Zerubbabel and Ezra had come back to reestablish the temple. There wasn't a great one-time exodus from uh, Babylon or or Medo Persia there to come back to uh, Israel. But in three waves, the first one, uh, larger group of people came. And before this time, now there's a whole paradigm shift. Before this Babylonian exile, Israel was pretty much agricultural. They had a lot of agriculture, a lot of of industry. As they got uh, really immersed and assimilated into Babylon, they became the shopkeepers. They became owners and business owners. That's one of the things that Babylon did. When they conquered you, and it was a bloody mess to conquer you, And if you made them fight you, same with the Assyrians, they would just do all kinds of horrendous things to you. But if you surrendered, you made it easy for them, well, they would take you back, and they'd set you up in jobs. You weren't just coming back as slaves, but you'd get jobs, you'd do things. They they would take people from one conquered nation, put them in another conquered nation, people's areas there, and they would mix them all up. So coming out of Babylon, there wasn't this great, after 70 years of captivity, this great desire to come back because they were pretty comfortable. In fact, they kept sending back and saying, hey, isn't anyone coming? Like, oh, yeah. And they became, and we've seen this even throughout history, uh, that they've become very good at business, and it's just been the way, and I would say that here in Babylon, it was really honed and developed. So now in the context, a hundred years later, well, a hundred years earlier with with Zachariah, who's going to, well, again, we'll get to this summer, but Haggai talking about you're living in your own paneled houses, you've given up for 14 years building on God's house, he comes, rebukes them. Um, they get things right. They have great revival. These things happen. But again, it just seems we just can't get away from the book of Judges, can we? We just can't get away from human nature where we walk with God, we forget about God, we get into bondage, and then we cry out to God and He saves us. Well, idolatry was never, ever going to be their problem again, nation of Israel. The 70-year captivity took care of that. They were not going to get back into idolatry as, as a whole, as a nation. Individuals will. But it wasn't going to be nationalistic. So something else is going on. Through that 70-year of captivity and actually prospering in Babylon, many were like, well, uh, can we just send money? Can we just send some other people? Can we hire some contractors? Can we do, do we really have to go back? And everything in disrepair. Again, with Haggai and Zechariah and the rebukes and the encouragements and the exhortation, now a hundred years later, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Look at verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. Hasn't God loved us? This 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 is how... The burden of the word of the Lord. And, and that's the whole thing. That is something that we need to have. I was taught very early in my walk with the Lord. You, you can have a burden and no vision. And you can be burdensome. And you can have a vision and no burden. You can be a visionary. But if you have a burden and a vision, now you're a missionary. Now, now you have something. Now, now you have something to go on. And that is that whole burden of the word of the Lord. He has the word of the Lord. He has a burden. To bring God's word. His name Malachi means the messenger. This is the messenger. He's coming to bring them a messenger. And again, we can receive from this and we can understand what he's trying to get across to us. I have loved you. He remember the understand the words of the prophet. The prophet was to speak from God to man. The responsibility of the priest is going to be very important if you're taking notes. The priest is to represent man to God. So the priest had a duty and the prophet had a duty. And they were to the work and together. What is God speaking to us? So now God is speaking to him. He said, look, I have loved you, saith the Lord. A hundred years later, there's all kinds of crazy things that are happening now in Israel, in Jerusalem, and in the temple, and with the priesthood. A hundred years later. I have loved you, saith the Lord. 
If you're taking notes, understand this. For God to have to say that and state that means they forgot it. And they're going to ask all these questions. And understand this, they're going to ask all these questions. It only takes me 20 minutes maximum now before I get someone yelling at me and screaming about where was God and if God loved me, why did he let these things happen? The ills and the things that we suffer and the way we perpetrate upon one another really stems all the way back to your issues with God. Because the question is, we have to think God is some great cosmic butler, Mr. Belvedere or something, and, and He should be taking care of all our needs, and we're doing all these things, and He desires and He wants to do those things. But then when it doesn't feel good for us, and I'm right there, folks, I've said the same thing. I've, had, I've said these questions that they ask, that God says that they've asked, and He answers, I've said. I say no more, no more. All right, Roberto Duran, no mas. You know, I understand this, all right, no more. I'm tired of getting drunk, uh, punch drunk here. So he says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, if you don't understand King James, that says, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? That's her question. How have you loved us? How have you loved us? God to say, I've always loved you. I, I've loved you. I've loved you. He says, hasn't, um, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. This translation, it doesn't mean that he just hates and implores. It means I loved less, or there's a lesser love. We're going to see that really played out more in the New Testament there. But he said, And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. We know that to be Edom, which is Moab, which is the modern Jordan going all the way down into Saudi Arabia. Didn't I lay these things waste? Didn't I do these things? We are impoverished. Look, he says, uh, verse 4, it says, Where, Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of, the wicked, of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. There is enmity in that nation. Look, God has made certain land covenant promises. We know that with the nation of Israel and also the nations around them. He's not going to make nice nice with them. They've already rebelled, they've already rejected, they've done these things and God has promised that look that this is going to be the border in the, of wickedness. This is what it's going to be known as. The people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Make a mental note to yourself. Am I a child of God's wrath? Does God have indignation towards me forever? If Jesus Christ is saving the Lord, if your relationship with God makes you sure that you go to heaven when you die, then no. 1 Thessalonians, all the way through the New Testament, we are not, we are not God's children destined for His wrath. We're not destined for His wrath. There is tribulation. I'm not talking about the great tribulation. We'll get more into that in the book of Zechariah. But there is problems. There is sorrow. There is taxes, there is death, there is, there is hardship. That is not the indignation and that is not the wrath of God. And sometimes there's pruning, there's chastening, there's disciplining that goes on. And Malachi is going to get to that very quickly here. Verse 5, And your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord be magnified from the border of Israel. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. This is the question here. This is what God's saying. A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? Where's my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? If Look, if you're calling me Father God, look, you can cross-reference this in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John around verse 44, when they, they accused Jesus of being an illegitimate child and, and questioned his lineage. He says, who's your father? And he says, God is my father. And they said, Abraham's our father. And he said, if Abraham was your father, then you would recognize me. If God was your father, you would recognize my voice. And John eight forty four tells us, but you are of your father, the devil. For he was a liar and a murderer from the very beginning. And you speak his native tongue. That's how I know. That's how I know. 
when we go around the country or when we go to Israel and we're going through the various shopkeepers, they can tell that we're even from uh, Minnesota. Don't you know, eh? How do they know that, you betcha? Okay, okay. I mean, how can they tell? We speak a native tongue. We speak a certain accent. We even know that as we're going through the Gospel of John on Sundays, that they even pointed out, Peter, aren't you a Galilean? Don't you? You have this certain dialect and you can... And so here, he says, if I... If a son honoreth his father and a servant his master, if then I be the father, where is mine honor? And that's the same thing Jesus Christ says to him. Where's God's honor? Where's his glory? What are you doing? If you really understood his voice, you would receive me. Well, here's Malachi speaking for the words of the Lord. It says, I'm your father, God the father. Where's my honor? Where's my honor? And if I'm your master, where's my fear? Where, don't I even get that? And saith the Lord of hosts unto you, priests that despise my name. And you say, you say, wherein have we despised thy name? It's amazing that God is even having a conversation with them. Look at the lengths that God is going to speak to the people to still try to win them back. We see that in Haggai. He says, look, I've loved you. There's always a remnant. There's always a thing. I'm always trying to come back and I'm always trying to do this. And he's, and he's, and he's coming after us and he's coming after us and he's coming after us and because he loves us and he cares about us. Again, we even see that in the New Testament. What does Jesus say about the good shepherd? That he leaves the 99 that are all taken care of their wealth and he goes after the one. But if the one doesn't want to come back, what can he do? I'm going to drag him back. And so here, a son honors his father. But you say, where have we despised thy name? Okay, you're going to ask that question? God's going to answer. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar and you say, where have we polluted thee? And that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. You're offering polluted, dry rotted, green moldy bread. Now again, talking about the temple. And you're, there's supposed to be that table of show bread. And there's supposed to be all the fine instruments and all the, all the articles and the furniture there. Something like that. And he, and he goes, look, the, the bread's moldy. You're, and you're offering up all these things that are coming. You're not giving the choice stuff. Remember, as you go through the sacrifices, you are to give God the choice part. What were the priests, like Eli's son and, and all the others, what was the thing that the priests continually do who were corrupted? They would say, oh, don't boil that, don't do that. Give me that piece first, and then you can offer up your sacrifice. And they start dictating how a person can offer up their sacrifice, and they began to steal and take from the people. They were feeding off the people. And God had already made provision through the sacrificial system, through the offerings that the priests would be taken care of. They had no inheritance. Listen, Christian, they had no inheritance. They could farm and they could work some lands and their families and all that, but they had no inheritance because God was to be their inheritance. God was to provide for them. If everyone's working and doing the things that they're all supposed to be doing and everything is in order, everyone's taken care of. Let's fast forward it to 2011. That's why I can categorically say, without reservation and without hesitation, if every believer, if everyone who called themselves a believer in Jesus Christ and attended churches that truly just taught the Bible and lived it out and applied it, there would be no war on poverty. There would be no welfare system. Because each and every one of us would be contributing and doing those things. And the church is here for the people. And we would be continually giving out. And there would be so much increase. So why isn't that happening? How is it that we can say there's 135 million? Let's even maybe be more conservative. Let's say there's 50 million evangelical Christians, born again, people who believe in the death and the resurrection, that there's a heaven, there's a hell, who believe in the biblical understanding of God's word of Christianity. If that is true, then why have 40 million babies been aborted in the last 35 years? How, how could that happen? How could there be an, uh, how, how could that be? If people really, really say they believe in the things of the Bible, how could there be all these things going on? It's just not so. Someone's falling down. The governments we have is that that which we elect or we don't elect. Uh, but it's also the people who are going to the office. And not just being. I was sharing with someone the other day, and they were. I was asking them about how their relationship with the Lord, if it made them sure to go to heaven when he died. And they said, well, you know, I'm good, and I'm going to do all these things. And, and I said, well, why is that? Well, I'm a good moral person. And I began to share with them, look, 
I was a good and morally upright drug dealer. I had compassion for people. I didn't steal from people unless they deserved it. I really gave a fair price. I gave a good product, I thought. And if you didn't pay me, I'd break your legs. But here's the difference. I would take you to the hospital. You know, breaking legs, business, taking you to the hospital, compassion. You knew when I broke any one of your appendages for not paying me that I would take you to the hospital. I'm just that, I'm that good. There were not other drug dealers like me. They would not be compassionate. They would not be moral. But I was. So by your standard, I should be able to get into heaven. First, like, no, no, that's drugs, is that? And I've been, well, I don't know what, by what standard. So when we go through Malachi here, Malachi here, we have to look at the standard that God is saying, you have offered polluted bread upon mine altar. And he's saying, where have we offered this polluted bread? Nothing changes. Solomon tells us there's nothing new under the sun. Jesus is teaching to love thy neighbor. And what does a religious, legalistic person says, I, I, want, I want to love my neighbor. Who's my neighbor? And you're around 5,000 people. And Jesus goes on to teach about the Good Samaritan and everyone gets upset because he uses a Samaritan. This is the same thing. Everyone's looking, well, for an excuse. Okay, I understand that, but who's my neighbor? Who, who really? Man would continually come to Jesus and say, look, shall I forgive my brother seven times? You understand, by tradition, you're only required to re forgive someone three times in their life. In their life. Peter comes up and says, Lord, shall I forgive my brother seven times? Peter, he's always doing that. I'll die for you. Let me do that Sunday. I'll die for you. Cutting ears. I'll... Not die. He runs away. I'm not... Seven times. And, and when he kind of looked around to the other guys, and he tells Jesus, he looks around to the other disciples, that's how humble I am. How good I am. And Jesus says, not seven times, but 70 times seven a day. Huh? A day? Wait a minute. It's like, man, there's just no getting around Jesus, is there? Every time I come up and I do something real spiritual, you know, he can get his committee together, can he? Judas got his committee together. Shouldn't that perfume been sold and the money given to the poor? Yeah. Later they find out, oh, he said it because he was stealing. Yeah, okay. We often don't know what people's agendas are and where their heart's at until much later, until it, it bears out. But understand this, he speaks to them. Where have you, he says here that you've ordered polluted bread upon my altar. And then you ask, well, when have, we pollu when have we polluted it? And that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. Listen, this is where familiarity breeds contempt. It's just like the knucklehead says, you know, I give to God. I give to God. I throw all my money up in the air. Whatever God wants, He takes. Whatever He wants me to have, it just falls down to the ground. It's like familiarity breeds contempt. You know, do we really need to change that showbread out? Does it, can it just last a little bit? Longer? I know it says its expiration date is this, but can, come on. Can we just a little bit longer and just all this laxness going on? And God had already pre prescribed how it's supposed to be done. And now the table of the Lord is contemptible. Familiarity breeds contempt. It's not new. It's not new when you can get caught up. And he's talking to the priest right now. When you can cut up, get caught up in the ministry, of the, the business of the ministry, and you're just, well, I can, I, I can just, I, I'm on autopilot that way. I can just do it this way. I can, I can do that. And, just, and there's a contempt in this. Familiarity breeds contempt. Verse 8, And ye offered the blind for sacrifice. Is it not evil? And you offer the lame and the sick. Is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. Go to Second Chronicles the end there and see who the governor was and see who was hanging out there. You can see there was a very exacting man who was out for himself. And so that's what Malachi is saying here. He says, would you, would you offer that up to him? Would you give that to him? Is that something that you would set out? You see, is it acceptable for that person say? Again, he's saying to the Lord of hosts. And now I pray, you beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. 
we will, uh, will he regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts? In other words, it's in your hands right now. It's up to you. God has given you this whole thing, isn't it? and he's doing these things, and, and, and is it honor? Hey, this might blow you away. I might give you a perception here. It might hurt some of the people's feelings here like that. But I am not really the spiritual giant. I have not always been this great of a person as I am now. I haven't always been humble. I haven't always been in the sense of that the, the husband or the father and stuff like that. And, I, and I, can, I can tell you because my wife applies the scripture right here. I can tell you not because I deserved it, because, but because she respects the office of being a husband. Stuff, not because I, I, I earned it by anything. I mean, I, I, I'm more so now than before. But, you know, I wasn't always given the bent fork. You know, parents are always all times we're going to sacrifice for our kids, sacrifice for our kids, sacrifice for kids. My wife and I got together early and we decided and we, 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 just, we just looked at history around us. We looked at people around us. We looked at other families. We looked at our own lives and we came up with a conclusion. Our kids are going to leave us. They are. As soon as they can. Sometimes they leave and they come back. But they're going to leave us. If everything works out, as I've raised all my kids in your financial planning, living at home with the parents, not an option. Get that through your head. Your spouse ever says to you, maybe we can live with your folks. Not going to happen. I mean, financial and things and hams like that, but not part of your financial plan, and this is a way to save money. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. But I was always preeminent. I didn't always get the bent fork. I didn't always get the chipped plate. There would be those times that our kids were younger, and there would be times that I would, as I'd come home from work, and I'm there in my truck, and a day of construction, I'd be outside, and I would be, just be praying, because I just, whatever's going to happen in that house, I'm going to be ready, and anointed up, and ready to go, and, and then, uh, unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize, but my wife would be getting ready, and she'd be talking, to me, now dad's getting ready to come home, he's doing stuff like this, and there was, there was always this preeminence. I always, always, always got the chicken breast, I love the white meat. And then my kids always got the thighs and the legs until they just started to develop taste. Oh. I remember the dinner table when they bit into the white meat and the breast. Like, hey, I like that. Oh, no, 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 you don't. They don't make three-breasted chickens. They don't. And for the three of us who like the white meat, it's just there's a fight. But I'm going to tell you something. I always got the biggest piece. I'm dad. I'm her husband. I'm who she sleeps with. Who do you think she's going to give it to? And we would let our kids know that. I mean, some of you have been around when we've said it's crude and all that kind of stuff like that, but I look, look, I'm, I'm sleeping with them tonight. I'm sleeping with her tonight. You're not going to win. We have kids that have never been able to play us one against the other because we know the other one. There's always been this preeminence. The times that our marriage lacked is when either one of us become contemptible, when I no longer treat her as the queen. When there's an expectation, when I just think we go in and out and it's just all this kind of stuff like that. And when I approach marriage in my life, like, well, I, I can do this. I can do my eyes closed. I can just walk through that. I learned a lot of this from my wife because how she treated me. And really where I am today as a pastor and how I lead and stuff like that is because I've learned it all in marriage and all the family and all the plans. Look, you don't do church and then try to do family. God's word says... That's the person you are. You do the family. And if a man can rule his household well, he can do all these things, and all, all these things, and it happens. If you can handle finances, if you can handle 10 bucks at home, you can handle 1000 bucks somewhere else. You can do that. And you take the family, and that, that's what comes into the church. But many a minister and many a people, just as we were at the church retreat this weekend, and Mike McIntosh was talking about, there's plenty of people who are just lazy, and they get into the ministry, and they're lazy. There's no working involved. And you can tell that they're wolves because by their diet, they eat sheep. And that's what's happening here. There's no preeminence. We'll just let the bread go. I never got the outdated yogurt. My kids did. I never got, I mean, there's all this stuff that I didn't truly realize until, and I make the joke, we'll be married 24 years and we're going to celebrate 19 good ones. But they're double time for her, so Kimberly's been married for like 50 years. But understand this, because it just took me a while, like, wow. 
She's doing this not, sensibly, not just because I, I'm, I'm worthy, uh, worthy and I love it, because she respects the office. And after she began to respect the office, I was like, oh, I better, I better shape up here. You know, I better start acting. And, and, and that's when ministry just began to con- continue to increase and increase on. And that's why we look at it. Anytime we look at ministry, anytime we look at our lives, anytime we look at our spouses, anytime we look at our job, as just, it, why can't it be like the first time? And it can, because there's an expectancy, a desiring. And this is the burden of the word of the Lord upon Malachi. A friend of mine years ago shared with me how he was getting bored reading the Bible. And so finally someone rebuked him and said, hey, look, I read the Bible. I read read the Bible over and over again. And the stories never change. And someone who's close to him says, you moron, in a loving way. The Bible never changes. We're supposed to. Oh, man, I just... Right in the holster. I logged that one. I'm like, that's right. Thank you for sharing that with me. And that's right. The Word of God is supposed to change. Do we have that burden of the Word of the Lord? Is it duty or devotion? Duty or devotion? We've seen this uh, in life and how we respect our bosses. My responsibility as an employee is to make my boss look good. That's it. That's why I very rarely ever been fired or let go on certain jobs or whatever. They didn't want to hear the word of God. They didn't let go. But for the most part, if my boss gets promoted, then I'm going to get promoted. If my boss looks good, I do everything I can. And the boss could be a total jerk. I've worked for them. But I'm respecting the office. I learned that from my wife. I, oh, I read it in the Bible, but I saw someone do it. And I noticed that as I respect that office and I respect that person in that office and that position, they started functioning like that. Be giving confidence. Boss would come by and say, hey, man, uh, can we do this? Me or you or us? What, what, be, be clear. Well, bosses would come up, hey, man, I just want to know if I can get you to do that. Are you signing my paycheck? Yeah. Well, tell me to do it. Yeah. If you're asking me, no. I would just like to come here and collect a paycheck. Read my Bible all day, kick back. Are you paying that? Are you paying me for that? No. Well, then, yeah. I, tell me to do this. I was more of a boss employee. I mean, just tell me, just tell me to do that. You're the boss. And then there'd be something like, and I, and I do this, folks. I even do this today in, in the ministry and, and leaders and in the police department and at workhouse and at the coffee house, whatever. You know, someone's coming by who's in a position of authority. That's right. There would be times like stuff like I would go into one boss's office. And some of you experience that. Sometimes I'll shut the door and I start screaming, Are you crazy? What are you thinking? And you're thinking, well, and everyone just kind of laughs because you know that's not really going on. I would go into my boss's office. Okay, boss, whatever you say, man. Whatever you say, don't fire me. I'll do it. I'll do it. He's just looking at me. You crazy? They're listening. I come out the door like, oh man, guys, get back to work. Get back to work. And you start coming to them. And then, you know, Melba Milk Toast comes out. Are you guys okay? I mean, that's the kind of bosses I work for. And they're like, I don't know what's going on, but if that, if that guy scares Chick, I'm getting back to work. And they're just like, hey, on one job, this guy kept calling. I was pastoring for years. He kept calling. My wife, is he, is he still pastoring? Because this one guy was a contractor. No one ever really respected him, but I did. And that's why I stayed employed all that time. You understand when it, when it comes here, the table of the Lord is contemptible and you offer the blind for sacrifice. I look at this pastor right there. Am I offering? Because you look, you're supposed to offer the best. No blemish, no nothing. And it says this way, you're offering up the blind and the sacrifice. You're offering up the lame and stuff like that. And I look at my own life. What service am I giving to my employer? What service am I giving? Am I giving you know, my wife a blind, lame sacrifice that she just has to put up with? are these the things. And I look at my ministry, I look at my life, and I look at my relationship with the Lord, and I look at the Scripture right here, and I look at this is the burden of the Lord, and I look at it. And I've already shared with you my best friend who taught me years ago. He says, you know what? When, when my wife or friends or family or friends or boss asks me to do something, immediately I go, if Chick asked me to do this, would I do it? Well, the same thing. I could tell you that I would look at my wife and I would say, as Mike Fernandez, well, if Mike was asking me to do that, I would do that. Because I would. 
And my wife would sometimes say, well, Mike just asked you to go do that. You do that. I'm like, yeah. And she'd look at me and she goes, well, you sleep with me. Oh, yeah, all right. Hey, Mike, sorry, I can't do that already. <laughs> do you understand? I, I, I'm not trying to be crude or for shock value. I'm just trying to be in the sense of the real. Like, the reality is, is like, would I offer that up? Do I do more for others than I do my own wife and kids? If anything, people should look at my life and look at my wife and my kids and say, how do I get into that family? Listen up, Christian. People should look at our lives and at Calvary Chapel St. Paul and look at the love that we're supposed to have and we should have for one another in the application and taking care of others' needs and go, I want in that family. There's no familiarity that breeds contempt. They see the love and the grace and the mercy. They see that we're not offering up blind, lame, pathetic, useless sacrifice. They're not seeing us walking around going, well, I have to do this. I have to be there. I have to do this. Sharing with someone the other day, I says, you know, sometimes you really misrepresent me. Some people think I'm an ogre because of just, you're crazy in your head. And there's no way to explain that it's you and not me. Here's what I like to do. If someone's offended by me, I really want to be the one to do it. I hate when people are angry at me and I didn't get to get them to be angry. I have no making you angry satisfaction. That only lasts about 30 seconds. But understand this, I didn't even get my 30 seconds of offense. Let me be the one. You see, because if I'm the one to offend, this is many times people try to minister to me and try to cover my sin. If I don't know that I'm sinning and blowing it and chunking it up with you folks, then I get no opportunity to repent and to get right with you. And making excuses for me and covering things up. I desire that. I am not perfection before you. I am a sinner saved by God's grace who God has gifted me to be a pastor and a shepherd, an evangelist, teacher, and a leader. And I want to offer it now up to the governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? saith the Lord of hosts. And now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. Here's the thing about Malachi. His lot is thrown in with them. You see, that's the other thing. We see that with Daniel. We don't see any sin in Daniel's life, but what does he do? He offers up and prays for all of them and he includes himself. We see that with Job. We see that with every New Testament or an Old Testament individual. We see this in the, with the patriarchs, with the prophets. What do they do? They say, look, I throw my lot in with you. Look, we all go up together, we go down together. And he says, look, that God would be gracious unto us. Do you understand that when one member suffers, we all suffer? If, like in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's in chapter 11 or 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says... Your meetings are doing more harm than good. That you come together to the Lord's table, which he tells us there that you're being contemptible of. And you're saying because you didn't bring anything to the agape feast, you just over there says there's people dying in your midst and you're here, you're here eating. Your meetings are doing more harm than good. It'd be better that you shut down than meet anymore. You're doing more harm than good by coming together. And so here, the Apostle Paul tells us that in Corinthians. Well, here, right here in Malachi, may the Lord be gracious unto this. This hath been by our means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi is going to suffer right along with them. We're going to see later in Malachi that he does protect the remnant. But there's going to be. Look, we are suffering because of 40 million abortions. This economy, these people are suffering. Uh, statistics and job uh, job statistics and stuff like that, there is a group of people who are missing. Do you realize 20 years ago, uh, Walmart and McDonald's were not being gracious and giving Silver Saints an opportunity to re-enter the workforce? It was 20, 22 years ago that the workforce realized we're missing 25 million people entering into the job market. But no one would make the connection that you've murdered 25 million babies through abortion through all these years. They won't make that connection. I make that connection. When a speaker literally gets up there and says, we just don't know where they are. And they come up with the excuses, maybe they're all living at home. Can you imagine 25 million kids living at home? And just, well, they're going on to other technologies. There's more people in school. No, actually rate uh, uh, of college uh, enrollment is down. 
there are missing people. So McDonald's and Walmart start hiring the, uh, the senior citizens again, saying, and they have their old big campaigns and their ads and stuff. Look, we're a friendly place. We're, we're friendly to the elderly and all that kind of stuff. That's the only ones they had left to work from. And yet, what do we see now in legislation that's coming around? Well, we're going to be knocking off the old ones too. Euthanasia. This is our governance. This is our legislation. These are the things here. And he says, so we all suffer from this. We suffer because of greed. We suffer from a generation. It used to be when I'm 48 now, it used to be when I was 20, in my 20s and 30s that major heads of companies were in their 70s and 80s. CEOs, 70s and 80s. Now we got 50-somethings and 40-somethings. And what have they done? They have robbed the corporations. The Enrons, the uh, Lehman Brothers, and, uh, and the Ponzi schemes, and the Bernard, uh, Mader, uh, Bernard Madoffs and stuff. All these things. Greed, greed, greed. There's a cable show. Remember, I only get cable once a week when I go visit my boy. And there's a cable show, American Greed. And they're talking, and they do stories of the most infamous greed of corporate America and these guys are sometimes, in some of the shows, they're even celebrated. The one guy they've never even caught. He just robbed everybody, left the letters inside. I'm sorry. And I'm like, there's a cable show now of how to rob. We see the thing is just going on and on and on. I beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. You know, it isn't the devil made me do it. There's only three ways that something's going to come about. God, Satan, or the flesh. My experience of 29 years now being a Christian is that Satan really doesn't have to push on me too hard. It's my flesh. It's my flesh. It's my greed. Look what he says here in verse 10. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. There's supposed to be a continual fire and a flame going. There should be this, op, this, should be this time. So look, can't one of you just shut the doors? Can't you just shut it and just stop it? Can't, can't someone just speak up? And it's what I preach and it's what I teach. That when it comes to mob mentality, listen, 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 listen. It only takes one calm voice of reason to turn a mob around. And if you have to throw your body in front of it, many people say, well, I tried, I tried. No, no. Which one of us, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, has resisted temptation to the point of the shedding of our own blood? I look around and go, I, I see. I see you selling your blood. I don't see you really giving up the blood. For, this, for us plasma people here, we understand that joke there. You, you, you understand there is, uh, is, is there even just one among you that would just say, no, just... Stop. Ichabod. The glory of the Lord is departed. Just just stop it. But you just keep going on. And it's the lame sacrifice. And you're just going on and on and on and on. Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even until the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name in a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. That's you and I right now, folks. We know that the bride of Christ right now is Gentile and whatever Jews accept the Lord, but it's Jew and Gentile. The bride of Christ are all those who accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And His name is to be glorified. Didn't you just love that last song to the Lord, to glorify His name? Just to glorify His name. Folks, feel like standing up and just glorify Him. Do it. We have no chandeliers here, so just bring your own and swing it around. But don't hurt the person next to you. But Understand, don't you want to glorify the Lord? And, and that's what we said. And look... Look at the protection right here. Even in the midst of this, God is going to protect a remnant. Malachi knows that his lot has been thrown in and it's with everybody else and he's going to suffer the consequences of everyone else's sin. But even in the midst of that, his, God's name is going to be glorified. That is the burden of the word of the Lord. What is your burden? Do you have a burden of the word of the Lord? I mean, I just... Today at my back therapy and just working on my back and, and, and a new... I don't know if they just do this on purpose, but they just gave me a new therapist, a physical therapist, and she says, what do you do? And really loud, what do I do? What do I do? She's like, well, yeah, what do you do? It says, I get to tell people about Jesus. And everyone else in the room, she said, really, uh, uh, looking at the phone, oh, uh, 
you're a pastor? Yeah, yeah, I guess that would be a good word for it. I said, no, I get to tell people like, that's what I do. And she said, really? And I began to ask her some questions. And just quickly, uh, I noticed she put a lot more weight on some of those machines. So I had a strain. I couldn't talk as much, but I'll see her again. What do you do? When someone asks you, what do you do? Tell them, what do I do? I get to tell people about how they can have a relationship with God that makes them sure they'll go to heaven when they die. I mean, you can answer the phone. Hello, hello, chillin'. Wow. I mean, you can do that. But I choose when someone calls me, praise the Lord. Uh, you know, right away if they know me or not, bill collectors like that. Called someone the other day. They said, "Oh man, I'm tired, man. I just woke up really. Can I call you back?" I mean, when I wake up, I go, "Wake up!" Didn't the phone wake you up? All right, praise the Lord. Quick. <laughs> Folks, from now on, for the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, and the name of the, uh, uh, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord. What is the incense? He's obviously not talking about temple worship. Let our voices rise like pork rinds. Let the... What does it say? What does the song say? Let our voices rise like incense. And now you're thinking of pork rinds. But understand this. Our prayers on the Lord. And what does it tell us in the book of Revelation? That the, the, the prayers of the saints just being offered up is like else. I guess it's like it would be a sweet smelling sacrifice. Look at verse 12. But ye have profaned it. Going back now. My name is going to be great. But you... Have you made the connection yet? What are we supposed to be in that millennial kingdom? Priests. Kings and peace. Reign and rule in that millennial kingdom. We get to have that title. What are we to be right now? New Testament believers, ambassadors for Christ. We're to be those priests. What is a priest's responsibility? Bring people to God. Bring people to God. And then you've profaned it. In that you say, the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even its meat is contemptible. You also said, behold, what a weariness is it. And you have snuffed at it, and saith the Lord of hosts. And you brought that which was torn, and then the lame and the sick, and thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? What have you brought? Just the remnants? Just the leftover? Oh, I, I've learned a lot from my wife. I've learned a lot from my wife when she's good at object lessons. She's not real, real good at object lessons, but man, when she gets one down, oh, oh, I'm good at all kinds of object lessons, man. She lets me know one time, and she hands me, uh, I think she read it in a book or something like that, but she hands me a bag. And what's this? And it's all the scraps, just scrap foods. She's not real big on leftovers, so she takes all these scrap foods, and she does all these things, and she shows me, because some of you might know, I will meet with you, Anytime if you buy me a meal. Understand that. I am unabashedly a foodie. Okay, you understand that. You want to meet with me? Just tell me where and when. I'll listen to anything you have to say. We're going to eat the meal first, but we're going to go for it. I'll do that. I will meet with you. I love food. And I'm bringing home stuff and bringing home stuff. And she says, this is what it's like with you. You bring me home a, a bit of steak. You bring me home a little hot dog. You bring me home a little of this. And this is what I get for dinner. That's what she said, that's my life. That's what, that's, these are all the leftovers. You, you meet with all these people. Don't treat me like someone you're counseling. You meet with all these people, and here's what I get. Oh, man. So what are you saying? You, you want me to bring you home a whole steak? I'm still a guy, right? I mean, you understand. You, what, you, you want me to call you ahead of time that you, you want some, I mean, just tell me. Guy, right? Just tell me. I'll do it. What do I got to do to make this better? No, I want you. You've got me. No, I want all of you. One of my kids, I'm, I, I make the joke, I make the joke that I have three kids, but I say I only like two of them, so that way they all vie for my affection and love. That's the iPad for Christmas. <laughs> I ain't saying... Take it what you want. These things work. These things work. 
Stuff that will never get published in a parenting book. But I have an iPad and you have kids. But just grabbing and just grabbing and just grabbing and just grabbing and all the kids and stuff like that. And there's Kara, just stuff like that. And, and just in the, in the boys, we got all a daddy. We got all a daddy. We got all a daddy. And Kara's, I want some daddy. I want some daddy. And this is just last week. But I understand that I just, and just, they're just standing there. Just, you know, we got them all. We got them all. Because, man, I'm just that way. I'm just outside. I just love when my kids were just small and little. Not less than a week, but they're small and little. And I would just be coming home. I'd get out of the truck. And I'd be like, Rah! And just kids, I could just see their little heads just running and running and running. They, teenagers forget it. They don't even move. But just little kids, they're just running and running and running. And they're like, ah! And we got all of daddy. We got all of daddy. I don't know what was going on with the boys and Kara, but the boys got, I got all of daddy. There's nothing left. Oh, Kara, come here. And I just picked it all up. And Kara just goes, oh. And she just looked at her brothers with just love in her eyes and says, you may have all of daddy, but daddy's got all of me. (laughs) Yes, my daughter, that's right. He may have bits of them, but he's got all of me. And I'm like, wow. And you know at that moment, maybe it just hit for you like, oh, I'm breeding spirit of competition with my kids, but God just taught me something. Does God have all of me? Right then and there. I'm just kids, man. If you don't have kids, go get some. All right? I just, I'm telling you, man. Go, go work in the nursery. Go in the children's ministry. You can't take them home. Some, I think you can. But... You just get with the kids and you're just there and just, and man, they just teach you so much. That, that's why as a pastor, because of learning that early on, that's why I endeavor to make sure that you can get a piece of me, but I want you to understand that I've got all of you. I pray for you. I love you. I care for you. I got all of you, man. I got you covered. I got your back. I got your back. Might drop the ball sometimes, but I got you. I'm there. And so here, you snuffed at it. And that's the thing that breaks my heart. That I'm like, I want, I want, I want. No, no. And, just, and there's contempt. And yeah, you might have brought lame sacrifices and lame things and lame that and whatever. And it might not have been pure to the Lord. Should I really accept it? But here's the reality of the Lord. He loves us. And we show up, and He'll take care of that side. He'll take care of those things, and He'll work in those things. But you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand? Say it to the Lord, verse 14. But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and, sancti- and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful amongst the heathen. Do we understand the God that we could be messing with? That you have the right proper sacrifice. It, it's one thing to say, this is all I have. I give it to you and the Lord will accept that. But to have the right sacrifice, to have the right thing there and to hold it back. You say, how can, how can I go this with this? Look, this is how, and I want to tell you how Malachi, this is how foundational it is in my life. After reading Malachi, I could never as an employee ever, ever, ever again go ask for a raise. I'll go get another job. But I will never walk into my employer and ask for and negotiate. That's why I hate unions. I hate those contracts. I mean, I've had to work for them. They've done all that, but I do not like it. He hired me for a certain wage. I can do that. I need to live at my means. Not raise my standard of living, but live in my means and do those things and to work those things. But how can I go to my employer and say, you got to pay me more and I'll work harder for you? How can we do that? How can I go to my employer and say, look, I've been sandbagging you right now. Actually, if I say that I can work harder for you, that means I've been stealing from you all along. And if that's what I've been doing, then shouldn't you as an employee pay them back? Say, yeah. Yeah, and I've been an employer. And I've had people come to me and say, well, you know, we want more money, stuff like that. Well, what will you do for that? Well, I'll work harder for you. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a raise. But what you're going to do is you're going to reimburse all the money that you stole for not working hard and doing what you said you would do this last couple of years. And therefore, then I'll give that to you next year if you work harder, and so therefore you have a raise. But first reimburse us for everything that you've stolen. You see, I've been an employee, I've been an employer. I've been a business owner, I've been a proprietor. 
I've done all those things. How can we? And I look at Malachi here. But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male. Cursed be any one of us as, as an employee, as, as, as a husband, as a father, that I have that love. That's why some spouses can sue for alienation of affection. You can sue your spouse's lover, affair, adulterer, fornicator, and you can sue them civilly for stealing and for the alienation of affection. And it's illegal. It's there. You can do that. Not many of them win. But there's a legal case that you can do that. You've stole my husband or my wife's affection, and, like that, and, you, and, and you can try to attach a wage to it or something like that. But if you have that love and affection, and maybe your employer, maybe your spouse, maybe whatever, and anyone in the position of authority, maybe character-wise they don't deserve, but neither do you and I. But if we respect that position of the office, I can tell you that I'm here today because someone respected the office of a husband. I'm here today because someone respected the office of a father. I'm here today because someone respects the office of the pastorate. Because you folks just keep showing up. I do everything I can, but you keep showing up. Now, it tells us in Hebrews that you should submit to your authorities out of the respect and love, that it would be good for you to not cause them problems. I'm just letting you what the Scripture says. But it is a joy. But understand this. I got you. I got your back. I got all of you in my heart. Me and Kimberly, we're up late at night gossiping about you to each other. For you single folks, get a journal. For the married folks, you talk and you pray for one another and you treasure them in your heart. You are my crown. You are what... 10 feet tall. I am I'm a giant in the room when I have my folks around me. And we go up after the church retreat and we take a photograph and stuff. And it's not a matter of pride. It's not a matter of stuff. And I'm just like, man, I love you. And you're in my heart and I pray for you. I got you. You might get a piece of me now and then, but I got all of you in my hearts. Lord Jesus,